Welcome to the 14th edition of the Pisa Sleep Award, enriched by the traditional meeting 11 minutes of sleep, entitled this year Sleep Deprivation and Insomnia Effects on Mental Health. We would have loved to host our speakers in Pisa for an on-site event. Unfortunately, we have been waiting for almost a year, but the current restrictions have prevailed and forced us to connect remotely. Despite this limitation, we are very proud of the quality of the current event and very grateful to all the moderators and speakers. Without a further hesitation, it is my honor and pleasure to pass the floor to the Rector of the University of Pisa for his opening remarks. Please, Professor Mancarella, thank you again for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Enrica. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, it's my great pleasure to welcome you, even though remotely, to, at the University of Pisa for this 14th edition of the Pisa Sleep Award. Well, to be honest, I'm at home, not even my rector's office. <laughs> forgive me and, and forgive my voice, but I'm cold. It's a seasonal illness, don't worry, nothing more. I've been checked this morning. <laughs> well, um, the Pisa Sleep Award has become a precious tradition in the field of sleep research over the years. An award established uh, through a considerable joint effort as so many extremely high profile scientists are, are involved. I wish to thank all of them, starting from professors Piero Salzarulo and uh, Luigi Murri, whose intuitive vision led to the first establishment of the award in 1994. This edition takes place in an extremely difficult times when all the countries have undertaken a strenuous reconstruction, not only of the economic and social issues of our society, but also of public health, starting right from sleep quality. <clears throat> Just a few months ago, the World Sleep Day reminded us that, uh, uh, reminded that of the importance of the sleep quality with the slogan, regular sleep, healthy future. And recently our Sono Lab, along with the Institute of Management of the Santana School of Advanced Studies uh, in Pisa, has published on the scientific journal, Chronobiology International, an important study on how stressful circumstances, such as the pandemic, affect the human health. Therefore, being here with you today is even more crucial than in the past. What, what all, all we have experienced and somehow, has, as you know, is still going on, is demanding us a greater emphasis towards sleep and sleep disorders to develop that healthy and better future with a crucial contribute of the entire community. In this field of studies, PISA has been in the forefront since many years, boasting a long tradition that started in historical period, not so different from the current one. Another moment of reconstruction, we might say. In 1948, we were getting over not a pandemic, but a long and exhausting war. And the University of PISA, one of the uh, at our university, one of the sharpest researchers in the field of sleep-wake uh, cycles, Professor Giuseppe Moruzzi, led the foundation of the so-called Scuola Pisana del Sonno. Well, incidentally, as an aside, an odd coincidence makes me think that all started in Pisa, not by chance, but because of a natural inclination to be a very quiet town in the past. Reading the memoirs of many literary men who traveled to our city between the 18th and the 19th century, Pisa has been always described as a sleepy city. Guy de Maupassant, for instance, depicted Pisa as a place in which lived the quietest, the most mournful and silent of people. Nowadays, conversely, we are one of the sleep capital cities for different and nobler reasons being interdisciplinary by nature, involves the most varied branches of knowledge of the University of Pisa, whose expertise, for instance, in the field of artificial intelligence 
and algorithms based on machine learning provide a key feature. This year, for instance, our researchers, together with the colleagues of, from the Institute of uh, Clinical Psychology of the National Research Council, created the first prototype of a smart bed to monitor the sleep quality. Whereas new wearable devices have been jointly developed with the Biorobotics Institute of the uh, Santana School to make sleep diagnostics less complex in the future. All these achievements have been possible thanks to a natural aptitude to debate, to dialogue. As I often remind to my students, good ideas like to connect, to merge, to recombine, to be reinvented by crossing conceptual boundaries. They want to complement each other as much as they want to compete among themselves. And this is somehow the spirit that enlivens the Pisa, the Pisa Sleep Award that I have, I have the pleasure to open today. Well, before giving the floor to the other panelists, let me thank the companies and the public bodies that in many different ways support this significant initiative, which uh, represents a great pride for, for our university. And finally, let me address a special greeting to Professor Vladislav Vyazovsky of the University of Oxford, who notwithstanding the Brexit, has given his valuable contribution. This witnesses that science has friendship, has no boundaries, and goes beyond any political and economic controversy. And this helps us be more optimistic for the future. Many thanks for your kind attention. Many thanks to the, to the rector of the University of Pisa. Thank you very much, Paolo, to be, to be here with the fever. <laughs> and uh, for the time you dedicated uh, to the Pisa Sleep Award and to the, in general, more in general, to the sleep research in, uh, in Pisa. Thank you so much. So now is the time uh, uh, for other institutional uh, greetings of uh, Professor Stefano Taddei the head of the director of the Department of uh, Clinical and Experimental Medicine. And uh, please, Stefano, so is, uh, is your time now. Stefano is, is not here. Okay. Dear colleagues, dear friends, I thank the organizing committee of the PISA Sleep Award for their invitation. The fourth edition of this ceremony confirms the importance of this award, which has also attracted increasing international attention. This is certified by the fourth edition of its accompanying event, 11 minutes of sleep, a symposium lasting a day and a half between the 16th and 17th June, involving the most important experts and scholars in sleep medicine from all over Italy and Europe. Sleep is certainly one of the most fascinating and somewhat arcane mysteries of human science. It's incredible to think that overall, we spend 23 years sleeping, about a third of our life, and four years dreaming. When we speak about sleep research in Pisa, the memory certainly goes to one of the greatest Italian neuro neurophysiologists, Giuseppe Moruzzi. Towards the end of 1948 at Northwestern University, Chicago, Giuseppe Moruzzi attended the laboratory directed by neurophysiologist Horace Magun. The collaboration between the two scientists clarified the biological basis of sleep with the discovery of the auricular system in 1949 and successively other important discoveries in this field. This achievement confirmed the successful link between scientists coming from Pisa and the city of Chicago. If we think that the 
più di questo paese, Rico Fermi, attivato il primo atomic battery in Chicago. In 1958, Muruzzi was appointed the director of the Study Center for Neurophysiology at the National Research Council, created at the Institute of Physiology of the University of Pisa. The center immediately attracted the very talented study. students, soon became a world class research infrastructure through his leadership in this research. The clinical application of this pioneering work found the fertile ground in Pisa and was further developed by distinguished clinical and health psychiatrists, such as Professor Santisti, Professor Moratorio, and Professor Moody. The scientists refined and deepened the understanding of sleep disorders in a large series of neurological and psychiatric pathological conditions involving adults and the elderly. Their work led to the creation the first clinical sleep laboratory, building the foundations for what is now considered an international recognized school. In 1994, Professor Moore and Professor Sartre Arrulo established this award that attracted the media world expert in sleep research. Progressively, other clinical infrastructures and research groups and became interested in sleep and currently in PISA, numerous centers are involved in the study of sleep physiology and pathology. Within the University of PISA, the group led by Professor Angelo Giuliani, Director of Psychology and the Sono Lab, within the Physiology Department, led by Professor Ugo Faraguna and Professor Paola Bascani. Within the University Hospital of Pisa, the sleep clinic of the psychiatric unit led by Dr. Laura Palagini and the sleep laboratory led by the otorolaryngologist Professor Stefano Berrettini. At the Monastery Foundation, the cardiology lab expert in sleep disturbances led by Professor Michele M. Over the years, fruitful collaboration have been established between these research groups and progressively extended to include other clinical research areas, such as the internal medicine, of which I am director, mathematics, bariatric surgery, and metabolic disorders. The transversality of sleep medicine has therefore made possible an extreme multidisciplinary of the medical staff to the clinical benefits for the patients and the important achievement in the research led by the PISA University. In addition to this local network, PISA has also been the driving force for national and international collaboration. The involvement of Professor Vladislav Wazowski from Oxford in the local organizing committee and the president of the European Sleep Research Society, Professor Nicholas, in the Committee for the Delivery of the PISA Sleep Award, certified the high profile sleep research currently undertaken in PISA. While the pandemic has precluded the, the celebration of the live event, this has not refrained the many talented and prestigious scientists to participate to the award, confirming the growing international attention to the ceremony and its accompanying events. On the other hand, we hope that the online event will incentivize the access to a greater national and international audience, attracted by a program of undoubted scientific value. I hope to meet you live at the next edition of the PISA Sleep Award in 22, but in the meantime, I wish to all my colleagues a fruitful work. And thank you very much for inviting me to introduce this prestigious uh, event. Okay. Thank you very much, Stefano. And uh, I think that uh, now is the time of uh, Professor uh, Gabriele Siciliano. So I give, the, I give the floor to Professor Gabriele Siciliano, full professor of neurology at the University of Pisa and director of the neurological clinic. Please, Gabriele. Thank you, Angelo. Good afternoon, uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, 
the respectable scientists and researchers participating to this event. It's uh, as an academic neurologist, for me, a great pleasure to host in peace at this uh, fourth symposium, 11 minutes of sleep. Uh, sleep medicine has had an impulse of great uh, growth uh, that places it among the medical disciplines uh, with the greatest development in the healthcare reality of the world. It is now established that respecting the sleep wake rhythm can become an important crossroad for improving the quality of life and preventing significant clinical consequences, such as, for instance, depression, hypertension, myocardial infarction, stroke, and so on. Other research has shown that brain levels of beta amyloid decrease during sleep. The results point to a potential new role for sleep in health and disease. In particular, if we think to the uh, significance and meaning of these results, uh, we can think to the interplay between sleep and the neurodegenerative process that seems of particular relevance. Adding new aspects in the field of neurology and sleep, apart from the well-known relationship in other uh, neurological conditions like epileptic syndromes and neuromuscular disorders. In this way, sleep medicine could be very important in the framework of precision medicine and preventive medicine. This fourth symposium builds on the successful experience of the first three events, overcoming as you know, former difficulties, a real sleep medicine network has been developed in PISA now with the creation of diagnostic paths for patients, but also sharing research fields among colleagues. This interdisciplinary vocation has been reflected in the imprinting of the scientific program of this workshop. It is obviously an occasion for interaction, fruitful interactions between the various specialists, starting from basic scientists to clinicians with very different backgrounds, mainly but not only physiologists, psychologists, neurologists, pneumologists, ear, nose, throat surgeries, psychiatricians, pediatricians, and so on, who are interested and active in the field of sleep research and medicine. Uh, the tra translational approach, collaborations, and discussion between these different specialists are welcome and are among the aims of this meeting. This is well paralleled by very, the very structure of this symposium, whose contributions range from rodent sleep to signal analysis, from brain plasticity during sleep to measure topics related to clinical practice such as dementia or obstructive sleep apnea syndromes. So therefore, I think that uh, the symposium will be a very uh, fruitful uh, background that uh, will encompass the biannual Pisa Sleep Award ceremony, an already well-established and solid tradition in the sleep field. This event is also a recognition of the role of sleep research in PISA, starting from that uh, scientist you well know, Giuseppe, Professor Giuseppe Moruzzi, a neurophysiologist in this area. So, on behalf of the scientific coordinators, I would like to thank the scientific committee for this useful advice to supporting the event. And now I will give the floor and uh, invite the chairman to begin the first session. I wish you a good uh, afternoon and a good scientific work. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriele. And now I think that Enrica Bonani uh, so the, 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 the real symposium will start, so I, I think. Um, 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is a great pleasure to uh, introduce this uh, uh, fourth edition of the symposium called uh, 11 Minutes of Sleep. Um, it is the fourth time that we are doing uh, this event, and this became um, a, a tradition, a traditional satellite event that precedes the, um, the PISA Sleep Award uh, ceremony. Unfortunately, this time we are doing this in the virtual format, and we kind of take a traditional picture as always, but I hope we can compensate for that in the, in the future. Uh, over the last years, we hosted a number of exceptional speakers who joined us for this event for the 11 minutes of sleep, and uh, this year will not be different. We uh, have a, a range of very nice presentations which will be happening today and tomorrow before the PISA, um, uh, PISA Sleep Award uh, ceremony. And the topic of this uh, edition of 11 minutes of sleep will be uh, sleep deprivation and insomnia effects on mental health. Uh, so, so I'm particularly delighted to, uh, to, to mention that our previous um, PISA Sleep Award awardees, Professor Irene Tobler and Professor Tarius Stenberg, uh, were able to join this meeting. And of course, I'd like to welcome Professor Dieter Riemann, who is the uh, um, awardee this, this time. So you would ask, so why 11 minutes? So the format of this uh, um, uh, event is that each speaker is given 11 minutes uh, sharp to present, talk about their work. Uh, and why 11 minutes is because of course, uh, it is uh, timing is important. This, and sleep is uh, a lot about timing and this is a reminder how, uh, how important uh, is, is this aspect. Uh, so if you have any questions, do, uh, uh, I'm addressing now both panelists and participants, please use the question and answer button on, uh, on the bottom. Uh, and I would like to introduce other two moderators of this uh, meeting. This is Professor Roberto Amici, uh, who is an Associate Professor of Physiology at the University of Bologna, and Professor Raffaele Ferri, who is a Professor and CTV Director at OASI Research Institute, IRCCS at Troina. Uh, and uh, now Professor Roberta Nietzsche will introduce the first speaker of this symposium. Thank you, Vlad. It's uh, a pleasure for me to introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, Stefano Bastianini, uh, who is active in the physiology section of the department of uh, biomedical and neuromotor science at the University of Bologna. I think that the presentation can start. Good afternoon. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizer for uh, the invitation and the opportunity of sharing my research with you. Uh, today, I will talk about the long-lasting relationship between perinatal stress and adult sleep or phenotype. The paradigm on uh, which my uh, talk is about uh, and uh, to which I will try to um, add some pieces of uh, new information is based on the concept that uh, uh, several different factors such as uh, maternal care, depression, abuse, malnutrition, and even the exposure to chemical substances can be considered powerful factors when acting during the early life period because they can permanently change um, the fetus and predispose it to uh, later life uh, disease. But how is this possible? Well, probably uh, several answers are uh, possible. However, one of the most important brain region uh, included in this picture is uh, the hippocampus. This is because the hippocampus mostly develops uh, uh, postnatally, both in humans and rodents. It is a highly plastic region, which means that it is uh, uh, much uh, uh, sensitive to uh, environmental modulation. And because the hippocampus is uh, in involved in the uh, hormonal stress response, being uh, very rich in uh, stress hormone receptors and particularly in glucocorticoid uh, receptors. Uh, in physiologically, in, uh, in utero life, uh, the uh, 
fetus is ex continuously exposed to um, high level of cortisol, particularly during the last trimester of gestation. However, when different kind of um, stressors are applied during uh, the pregnancy, this uh, may lead to a huge increase in uh, um, cortisol level, thus exposing, overexposing the fetus to glucocorticoid. And this is, as, uh, uh, as already been uh, uh, demonstrated, to affect several physiological aspects of the fetus. And today we will uh, talk uh, particularly on the development of the hormonal stress response. As we all know, the hormonal stress response uh, is uh, uh, starting by the hypothalamus with the release of CRH, which acts on the pituitary gland um, to make it to produce uh, a ACTH. High level of uh, circulating ACTH does uh, uh, produce, uh, make the adrenal glands to produce uh, uh, cortisol, which is considered the final and the most important stress hormone uh, that we have in our body. Um, of course, this uh, access, uh, this uh, access as a very different level of uh, regulation. But today we'll talk. Uh, we will talk only about. Uh, uh, involvement of the hippocampus in this uh, um, regulation. And uh, as I told you, the hippocampus is very rich in uh, glucocorticoid receptors. And this makes the hippocampus very sensitive to the circulating level of cortisol. And when the hippocampus is activated, it exerts an inhibitory effect on the hypothalamic release of CRH. Does the hippocampus represent, uh, represents a um, a very important uh, inhibitory stations in the regulation of uh, uh, the hormonal stress response. And when we apply a different kind of perinatal stress, we may have probably through epigenetic uh, modulation, a down regulation of the glucocorticoid receptors in this uh, brain uh, region. Uh, as a consequence, uh, the uh, hippocampus uh, results to be uh, less sensitive to uh, circulating cortisol, and then uh, it cannot uh, uh, perform uh, um, a physiological in inhibition of the hypothalamic release of CRH. Thus, in turn, um, lead to an imbalance of the level of CRH, ACTH, and cortisol in our blood. And as demonstrated by this table, each of these uh, uh, hormonal uh, stress mediators uh, can have different effects on wakefulness, non-REM sleep, and REM sleep. And sometimes they are also uh, opposite effect between these uh, uh, mediators. And these uh, effects are also, uh, seems to be at least uh, different between uh, uh, humans and rodents, yeah, at least in some aspects. Um, this is uh, uh, probably a reason why um, at the moment there are several different uh, uh, results on uh, uh, experiment performed by applying different kind of perinatal uh, stress on rodents uh, that lead to different uh, uh, results. For instance, we have uh, um, in some, for some uh, experiment an increase in REM sleep time some other also report a concomitant increase in non-REM sleep time. Some other produce uh, data on a reduction in non-REM sleep time, and some other again an increase in REM sleep time. So uh, very different results by applying uh, different uh, kind of perinatal stress, and uh, uh, this is probably the reason uh, why we cannot uh, uh, predict. Uh, the relationship between uh, a, a specific kind of perinatal stress and the effect on uh, uh, the adult sleep uh, phenotype. In this picture, we want to include also uh, uh, 
notion that uh, uh, pharmacological substances can be considered as uh, stressing uh, factors for uh, the development of a correct uh, wake sleep phenotype. And uh, uh, with our last research, we focused specifically on the consequences of uh, perinatal exposure to nicotine or cotinine, which is the main uh, metabolite of nicotine. And uh, what we look at was the uh, um, uh, sleep phenotype in adult mice. So what we did was to uh, administer uh, nicotine or cotinine or a control substance to pregnant dams until pup weaning. Then we let the pup to grow up and then we studied them uh, during adulthood, looking at the sleep phenotype and also at the hippocampal molecular uh, status. And uh, what we found uh, was, uh, as expected, the prenatal exposure to both nicotine and cotinine produced alteration in the uh, adult sleep phenotype, particularly increasing the time spent awake during the light dark transition which uh, in uh, a mice uh, correspond to the uh, awakening, uh, probably the cortisol awakening response period. On the other hand, we also found that the uh, prenatal exposure to nicotine produced uh, alteration in the EEG power spectrum, spectrum during uh, REM sleep, as we can see in this graph. And what about the molecular status of the hippocampus in these uh, mice? Well, as expected, we found a significant, a significant downregulation of uh, glucocorticoid receptor expression in the hippocampus of both the nicotine and cotinine uh, mice perinatally exposed to these stressors. And with, of course, compared to their controls. And we also found a significantly but inverse correlation between the time spent awake during the light dark transition and the level of expression of the glucocorticoid receptor in the hippocampus. So these uh, uh, data uh, um, demonstrate the relationship between uh, a perinatal stressor uh, such as uh, a pharmacological stressor uh, like nicotine and the long-term consequences on uh, adult sleep phenotype. And probably the correlation between these two uh, aspects is some kind of epigenetic modulation that involves uh, the hippocampus and particularly the expression of uh, glucocorticoid receptors. So the normal situation in conclusion is that uh, uh, the perinatal period is a, a very sensitive period to uh, a stress event. And when no stressors are applied, then we, we can have a normal hippocampal activity with a normal development of the hormonal stress response and no consequences are expected on uh, adult sleep phenotype. However, when we applied different kinds of uh, stressors, such as nicotine or cortisol, but we may also think to many others, then we may have an epigenetic modulation of the uh, development of the hippocampus and uh, uh, with that also an alteration of its activity that produce a permanently change in a permanent change in the uh, normal in the hormonal stress response and uh, this effect uh, translating into adulthood may thus justify the impairment in the sleep phenotype that I have already shown uh, to you so finally I would like to thank all of you for your attention and of course all the members of my teams that helped me in producing all this data and also the theory that I talk about today. Thank you. I thank uh, Stefano Bastianini for this presentation. I think that uh, the, the talk is open to discussion and uh, I ask all the participants and the audience to, to use the questions and answer form that is available to, to write uh, any question because uh, now I 
don't see any question in the form. There is someone in the, I guess that mm, it's not possible to use the microphone just using the chat. Uh, Vlad, can you confirm that? Yes. So if you have any question, please use the question and answer form. So in, in, in the meanwhile, I, I can ask uh, uh, Stefan, Stefan, are you present? I guess, yes. <laughs> and uh, have you any idea or did you check uh, the epigenetic mechanism involved in this process? So you took uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Of, of course, we had uh, several ideas on uh, uh, the possible epigenetic mechanism uh, involved in uh, in the process that I talk about. Um, due, to, due to the format, uh, I just uh, skipped this part. But uh, uh, the thing is that uh, uh, we try to have a look at the uh, epigenetic modulation of the glucocorticoid receptor and specifically looking at the methylation status uh, of uh, its promoter region. But uh, we actually failed to find any uh, significant uh, difference at the moment. Uh, the idea, the original idea was to test an hypothesis uh, uh, based on original uh, pioneeristic uh, paper of 2004 in which uh, uh, they demonstrated that uh, uh, specific methylation of uh, this, uh, of this uh, gene region was uh, uh, associated to um, with this uh, modulation of uh, glucocorticoid receptor. We try to look specifically at this uh, uh, um, aspect, but uh, uh, we failed. And uh, this is probably to the, uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, they look uh, at uh, this stuff in uh, rats rather than in uh, uh, mice as we did. And also because they apply different kind of stress, they apply um, uh, a, cro a, a kind of cross fostering uh, uh, rather than uh, a pharmacological uh, test. Sorry, the my, uh, your mic is is off. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. So I I, I think mm. I have replied to yeah. the question. I don't know if uh, there are any other. Please, Vlad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this is, I would like to remind all the panelists also, please use the uh, uh, hand to put it up if you have a question, but I have a question actually that I would like to ask. Sure. Stefano, thank you very much for the talk, which is very interesting. So you, you showed some changes in sleep, but of course the question is how specific are these changes for sleep or specific aspects of sleep, such as spectral power, because probably other uh, important physiological or behavioral changes occur and changes in sleep may be secondary. So are you collect, Are you doing any other kind of phenotyping and looking at other aspects of any of behavior and physiology that can accompany those sleep changes? Yeah, uh, thanks Vlad for, for your question. And uh, mm, yes, I, we also had a look at the sleep homeostasis in this uh, experiment, uh, so we, uh, try to sleep deprive the, the mice for a six hour and then to have a look at the uh, sleep rebound after this period. And, uh, mm, but um, actually we, we couldn't find any difference in, uh, in the sleep rebound uh, nor in the slow wave activity uh, between the three groups. Uh, so we cannot conclude anything about that. As I showed in, uh, in, the, uh, in the presentation, we just found a subtle uh, uh, alteration in the EEG, in the peak of the EEG during REM sleep, which is nice because, uh, as you know, the, uh, the, this, this rhythm indeed is uh, uh, mostly uh, developed at the hippocampal level, so it, it fits with the, <laughs> with, the, uh, with the picture, but it's just a subtle uh, difference. And uh, to answer directly to your question, uh, we didn't have the chance to have a look at um, any consequence, behavioral consequence uh, uh, of this specific uh, uh, sleep loss at the uh, light dark transition uh, yet, but we are performing a similar experiment, we are just using a different uh, toxis, uh, toxin uh, in which we want to also to include uh, um, several behavioral tests and uh, I, I will let you know about that when we, we will complete this. Thank you, thank you very much.
Uh, um, I, I can question. I can ask another question if um, if you so we still have three more minutes right for questions. Um, uh, Stefano, can you maybe remind quickly the uh, about glucocorticoid receptors in the hippocampus? Are they present on all cell types to the same extent, or you have differences, for example, between pyramidal cells and inhibitor interneurons? Are there a differential kind of expression pattern? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are um, in, in this experiment we look at the whole uh, hippocampus uh, because it was just uh, um, and um, um, a try to, to to have a look at, at the whole uh, structure. Uh, of course, uh, we know that the uh, there are different uh, type of, of type of expression in the in the hippocampus uh, uh, between the different part of of the hippocampus. Of course, we, we know about that, and we also know and we had a look at different kind of uh, um, corticoid receptor because we have to, to keep in mind that we also have a mineral corticoid receptor, uh, which are the main which are the mainly actually uh, um, uh, like receptor for 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 um, for cortisol and corticosterone so uh, when we have cortisol in our body um, first we have uh, the, um, an interaction with the mineral corticoid receptor and then we with a glucocorticoid receptor and so we also include this in uh, in our experiment and we also found a down regulation of mineral corticoid receptor uh, after exposure to nicotine uh, um, substance uh, during perinatal, perinatal period but at the moment, uh, uh, we, we didn't have the chance to uh, separately look at different areas of the hippocampus. But uh, this is, of course, a, a very nice uh, uh, indication that you, that you uh, told me. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? For from the audience, I don't see anything on the chat, anything. Okay, thank you. Then probably we can proceed to the next yes. speaker. Thank yeah, thank you, Stefano. Thank you, Professor Amici. I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker of this uh, session, Dr. Caroline Lustenberger. Uh, who is a SNSF Ambizione group leader at the Department of Health Sciences and Technology uh, at the ETH Zurich. Um, so, uh, Caroline will present on the potential of non-invasive brain stimulation to modulate oscillations of the sleeping brain. Uh, and I would like to invite, um, uh, again, uh, all the participants, please, you can start typing your questions during the presentation. So it is a pre-recorded lecture. It will not distract the speaker, and then it will give us some questions to start with. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Caroline Lustenberger from ETH Zurich, and I'm really glad to be part of the Peace Asleep Award ceremony. So thanks to the organizers for inviting me. And I also send my sincere congratulations to the recipient of the award, Dieter Riemann. Today, I will take you on a journey to illustrate how we can use non-invasive brain stimulation technology or short NIPs to modulate sleep oscillations. And I will specifically focus on auditory stimulation to modulate slow waves because this approach has gained a lot of excitement in the last years. I will also demonstrate that this method is still in its infancy and that it's still highly controversial that these changes that we see during sleep whether they translate into a functional meaning that is also observable for society. For that, we still need to establish a lot of critical points to elaborate on the true potential of this method. So oscillations of the brain are like the language of the brain. We can also compare them to a symphony. So in an orchestra, musicians have to play in synchrony to generate the symphony. And synchronization among neurons varying in time and space is also a fundamental property or principle of the brain, how it enables, for instance, cognition and behavior. And if thousands of neurons are synchronously firing or in silence, they generate strong endogenous fields that can also be captured as oscillations, for instance, in the EG. 
And during non-REM sleep, our brain plays a very specific symphony that is hallmarked by slow waves and sleep spindles. And these sleep oscillations have been related to different brain and body functions and have therefore been suggested to be carriers of the restorative effects of sleep. But we all know correlation does not imply causality. And now we can use these NIPs to modulate the sleep oscillations and see what the consequences are on different brain and body functions. And we learn more about direct causal links between these sleep oscillations and different functions. But these methods also come with the hope that we can promote a better version of sleep and with that enhance our daily performance. Or that we also restore diminished functions in conditions that are hallmarked by impaired sleep oscillations such as is part of the aging process or in disorders such as Alzheimer's and schizophrenia. And among many NIPs, currently specifically auditory stimulation during slow wave sleep has gained a lot of attraction. So this whole excitement started in 2013 with a study of Ngo and colleagues, where they applied very precisely during slow waves, pink noise bursts, that you can see here, during the up phase or up state of slow waves. And this is the time when a lot of neurons are strongly synchronized in a specific regions. And they found that they can enhance subsequent slow waves upon auditory stimulation compared to sham. Also, they saw that the coupling of slow waves and spindles is enhanced. And along with that, they also found a significant enhancement of word pair memory consolidation. And this proof of st principle study that was done in the lab was repeated multiple times in other lab and single ses session studies, um, but mostly in young participants and very often to look at memory consolidation in a very specific word pair task. But whether such an enhancement of slow is also translatable into real life scenarios. So going beyond well-controlled settings have not, has not been established yet. And to do that, we basically developed a portable device that is able to do this precise closed loop application of sounds during slow wave sleep. And at the same time measures with very accurate electrodes, biosignals in the quality that we also achieve in the lab. And we used this device in a first clinical trials, trial in elderly between 60 and 80 years of age, in which these participants are wearing the device at home and applied that by themselves for several nights. And in seven of these nights, we used a very specific stimulation approach where we had during six second windows, up phase stimulation of detected slow waves, and in the off window that was the same length, no stimulation. And we alternated this window throughout non-REM sleep when slow waves were prevailing. And this on-off windowing gives us the opportunity to directly look what happens within the night. And we also had sham nights in a counterbalanced and crossover design where no stimulation was applied. Here you can see the results on the group level. So what we see is a significant in the 16 participant enhancement of slow wave activity as a marker of slow waves in the on versus the off window. And this is highly and strongly different from the sham nights. But when we go away from the group level and look what happens on the individual level, we also see a little bit of a different picture. So here you can see every night as a point during sham and verum in red and shame in gray and the difference between on off. And what you can see is that our participants, so-called weak response that have actually no real observable response in slow life activity up on tones or some that have very small and inconsistent differences and participants that have a very strong difference. What we also see is that one of almost a clear cutoff prediction of whether one is a weak or a strong responder was seen in the baseline slow life activity. So the slow life activity that was recorded before stimulation started. And weak responders were also hallmarked by having actually a rather low level of slow wave activity. And this might have clinical implications because we are also interested in modulating specifically participants that might have diminished slow waves. And the question arises, is this even possible in these populations? And to get a better understanding 
of how we can make stimulation more effective and maybe also personalize it, we also have to understand what the mechanism is behind, how auditory stimulation modulates lowest. And we don't know yet what is actually happening. There is the hypothesis that specifically non-lemiscal pathways of auditory processing are involved. And we have the thalamocortical matrix neurons that innervate different widespread cortical areas. And so that these matrix neurons are helping in synchronization. And we know synchronization is the basis of an oscillation. So the idea is when they are played, these tones during upstates, that the firing is more synchronized among neurons also across different cortical um, regions. And because these neurons are also in a bistable state, they will also be more synchronizedly in the down state. And this will be shown as more pronounced slow waves. But it's probably not that simple in a way of when we look at the spatial levels, there might be different types of slow waves, such as more cortical and local slow waves and more global and also subcortically involved slow waves like the K-complexes. And auditory stimulation might differently affect it. Also, different brain regions, including subcortical regions, might be affected by tones and changes there might have not been captured yet in a superficial EEG. And with that, I come to the discussion about the potential. And we can ask a very simple question. We can just say, does auditory stimulation have the potential to modulate sleep oscillations here, specifically slow waves? And we can convincingly say, yes, this is the case. We see it in in-lab studies and we see it in translational in-home studies. But there is a huge gap in also answering whether these changes that we see currently and the level of, of changes we see, whether they translate into any real life functional outcomes beyond the lab and beyond very well controlled memory consolidation paradigms. And there's, this is a huge um, controversial discussion because there are already companies that sell these auditory stimulation devices and claim they can make better sleep. But we need to understand what is actually better sleep, how we can promote sleep and what is a good impact. And this has not been uh, clearly established and mapped out yet. Also, are the effects linear? Is everyone benefiting if there is more slowest and the more we have of those due to auditory stimulation, is it always better? I don't think so because we have a homeostatic system and so there will be rebound effects that we have to consider. There might also be unwanted secondary effects, which not, will not be surprising, right? Because we with tones, we go over different levels in the brain, including neuromodulatory arousal systems, such as the locus cerebellus. The question is that we have also changes that translate into unwanted side effects that we haven't captured yet. For instance, in our in-home study, we have seen that we have an, a reduction in REM along with mood, which has not been established in previous lab studies. Also, we see huge inter and inter-individual differences, and we need to understand what predicts them to make more effective and more individualized applications. We also have to better understand what settings of auditory stimulation will help to maximize the potential, specifically maximizing and enhancing the functions we want and reducing secondary side effects. And finally, everything that we see in the lab, we have to translate into real life settings. And if that I already come to the end, so overall, we, we can say we have a tool at hand that we can use to modulate slow waves. However, whether this translates into any important and relevant um, significant function is still not clear. And I believe it will be important to better understand specifically the mechanism to answer these questions. To understand how sleep oscillations are linked to different brain and body functions and how auditory stimulation modulates this link, what mechanism is behind. And for that, we have to go clearly away from just looking superficially into an EEG that just captures mainly very synchronized cortical activity. We have to use different animal models, maybe computational models as well, to understand what is happening on different levels of the brain. This will help to make more mechanism-driven and rational designs possible which I believe is the foundation for most effective stimulation. And in the end, we also have to see whether any of these changes translate from lab findings into a societal impact. Thank you very much.
thank you. Thank you very much, Carolina. It was, it was great. It was one minute longer than 11 minutes, but it was close to that. So we already have a few questions. And um, uh, so I will start with the question from Professor Riemann. Um, can you say something about the quality of the tones you used? Hello, Fla. Thank you very much. Hello, Carolina. So, um, the quality of tones, so what typically is used in almost all of the studies is pink noise. So one over F noise where lower frequency um, parts of the sound are more pronounced than higher frequency parts. And normally they're also around 50 millisecond bursts that are used and times during up phases of sleep. And we used actually the same in this study that I showed you the results of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, um, the next question is from the Q&A, uh, um, from Mahdad Jafarzadeh. In a controlled environment, the sound level and the slow oscillation period are measured during an adaptation night and then applied to the experimental night. How did you control this at home? Yes, yeah, so um, we had a, a screening night where we let the participants sleep with the device. We use that to first see whether they can actually handle the device and are able to apply that themselves, because I think that's also a key part of it is they really applied the whole system by themselves over multiple nights in a, like in a real life scenario. And then we looked whether they are able to sleep with the device and whether they are feeling comfortable with it. But we at this stage did actually not play tones. Um, and we use the screening out only to see whether they want to continue with this device. For the tone application, we actually used an algorithm that was able to adapt to the depth of sleep, or let's say to the amount of slow waves, as well as whether they show the rouses. So we decreased the volume. It started around 50 decibel, and we increased it up to 60 decibel if they did not show any signs of awakening. And if they had a certain level of slow waves that they reached, and then we went down again, if we realized that there were signs of arousal, such as an increased alpha or beta frequency range. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, next question from Professor Irene Tobler. Slow waves decrease in the course of the night. Do you adapt stimulation accordingly? Yeah, so this goes actually to the, the answer that I said before. So we because this closed loop system that we used is basically um, taking slow wave activity into account. So it only stimulates when there is prevailing slow wave activity. And in this case, it will also adapt the volume to it. I have to emphasize in this study here, we used um, stimulation over the whole night during non-REM sleep where slow waves were prevailing, but we also see, of course, towards the end of a sleep period, Specifically, also in elderly, we don't really see that much of stimulation anymore. Other studies actually only used in the first three to four hours stimulation and stopped after that. But we used the whole night um, to map that out. Thank you. Next question is from the Q&A session from Linus Melinsky. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Did the elderly participants in the described study show different he hearing thresholds in the waking state due to age-related hearing loss, for example, and if so, uh, in uh, how far could the lack of effect of sleep stimulation in the weak responders be compensated for by adapting stimulation intensity to individual hearing thresholds? Um, this is actually a really important question. <laughs> and we, of course, also thought about that. So importantly, we did an audiometry with all participants. And we specifically actually used an audiometry that used these pink noise bursts we used for the intervention. because. Hearing loss is frequency dependent, so not all frequency um, uh, are similarly lost with age, specifically higher frequencies. So we use the pink noise um, that we use, and we just use different volumes. And we wanted to see whether they're actually able to hear it. Um, what is important, we have this hearing information, and we compared it between the two groups, the weak and the strong responders, and there was no difference in the hearing threshold. But uh, we have to, of course, say it's different to, difficult to compare them to young people where you have clearly a higher or a better um, hearing and a lower hearing threshold. Thank you. The next question is for, from Professor Tina Tonia. Thank you for the great talk. We observed in our study published in sleep a potentially negative effect on mood. 
You also considered in your talk the potential negative effects. Did you look at these subjective symptoms in your data? Um, yes, so we also looked at mood. Actually, we assessed it daily, um, every morning and every evening um, throughout the time they were wearing the device. And we actually also saw a slight reduction in mood, both in the morning and in the evening. And across, we also had a different type of stimulation setting as well. So it was actually a rather robust finding. But what was interesting, it was not related to any slow wave effect. So we correlated to slow waves, to slow wave changes. But we saw that we also had a very slight but consistent reduction in REM sleep um, in our participants. And this was correlated and somehow predicting maybe the mood changes. Okay, thank you. Then uh, I have uh, probably like a comment, so if you could uh, maybe comment on that very briefly from Don Santa Maria. So we recommend to patients with sleep problems to avoid ambient noises or even listening to radio music. Do you have anything to respond to this? Um, this is, I think, important thing to consider. So the application we do is a closed loop system where we very precisely time these sounds. And I think that's a key aspect of the stimulation. If you would just randomly throughout the night play these sounds, I, I'm also very confident that we probably would awaken subjects at some point. And there has been a recent studies from Yuval Nier and colleagues um, in rodent models, though, where they showed the level of uh, the tonic activity of the locus ceruleum might be important of whether you awaken from an from a sensory stimuli or not. And I think. Um, it's somehow important to take that into account. And maybe also in, in patients that have insomnia, so such an arousal or activation level might even be higher. So we probably have to consider that also during deep sleep. Okay, thank you. And the last question from Professor Ferry. Do you have data on adaptation? Stimulating several nights will most probably lead to adaptation by the subject. So we looked at these seven nights separately as well. And as far as we look at this on-off difference, and that was one of the figures I showed you, um, there wasn't a difference between the sham levels um, across the night. So in all of the seven nights, we saw the, the change among the similar range when we look at the group level. So we didn't really see an adaptation effect. But another question, of course, is in a, in a different time scale, what happened within the night, right? I think that's something we didn't really look at, or even within a few tones in a row, how something like that adapts. And it's an important aspect to look at. Thank you very much, Carolina. We're perfectly on time. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you again and pr uh, go proceed to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Leila Tarab from the University Hospital of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry and Psychotherapy and Translational Research Center, University Hospital of Psychiatry and Psych Psychotherapy uh, at the University of uh, Bern. And the title of Leila's talk is Sleep in Childhood and Adolescent Development. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak at this symposium honoring the work of Professor Riemann, who has done some of the seminal studies in studying sleep and mental health. Um, and thank you to the organizers of the committee for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be presenting some of our data on sleep in child and adolescent development and sharing with you some of the challenges and opportunities of studying this age group. Now, one of the changes we see across this period, which is very dramatic and uh, you rarely see, is that across this period, we see a significant decline in the amplitude of the sleep EEG signal. So for example, here's one child who was 10 years old when he first came to the lab, and here he is just a couple years later, and uh, you see that the amplitude of the EEG signal across all stages is dramatically diminished. Now, this is just 30 seconds of data, but we can look across the entire night and we see the same thing. So this is slow wave activity from ages 9 to 18, and starting around um, age 12, um, in girls and a little bit later in boys, we see about a 40% decline across this period um, in the amplitude of slow ac wave activity. Now, we see a similar picture with regards to sleep spindles. Um, for sleep spindles across the adolescent period, we see a decline in the amplitude, duration, and absolute sigma power of sleep spindles. But interestingly, simultaneous to that decline, we see that the frequency density and relative 
power um, in the spindle band in relation to other oscillatory frequencies is increased. So this suggests that during sleep, we see the changes of the brain to the brain and rewiring that's occurring during this period. Now, um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about these changes that's, um, that are happening across this period is that there have been a multitude of functions associated with sleep spindles and slow waves. So for example, sleep Consol uh, consolidation of memory, sleep homeostasis, uh, synaptic homeostasis. And really, given that these um, oscillations are changing so dramatically across this period, the question arises, are these functions pre preserved across development? And also, interestingly, can we use adolescence as kind of a model system for understanding the functional relevance of these oscillations? So for example, does the fact that we see a 40% decline in slow wave activity activity imply that there is less need for synaptic homeostasis across this period. Now, despite these large changes that I summarized for you, we do see a large degree of stability in other measures. So this is data from um, each of each one of these colors shows data from one participant. These are four nights of sleep EEG data separated by two years. And what you can see once we normalize the power is that across two years, that the shape of the spectrum within a participant stays stable, so um, very reliable and unique to an individual. So we can differentiate this subject in green from the subject in blue. So this observation kind of spurred another study, which we used twins to look at the heritability of the sleep EG. And in that study, what we found was that in, for slow wave activity and for sigma, which is associated with sleep spindles, much of the variance over posterior regions is due to genetic factors. So the findings from this study made me think that maybe the sleep EEG is a wonderful biomarker for mental health. And what I mean by biomarker is that perhaps it can tell us something about it can be a go-between um, to the underlying causes, such as genes, to outcomes, such as psychiatric disorders. And in adolescence, we're in urgent need of biomarkers that can measure susceptibility to mental health. And that's because most psychiatric disorders have their onset during the adolescent years. And if we're early on able to detect um, vulnerability in this age range, then we have an opportunity to intervene and also potentially um, alter the trajectory of mental health. And indeed, there are lots of associations between sleep neurophysiology and mental and psychiatric illnesses. So, um, and in line with the new view on psychiatric illnesses as rather continuous disorders rather than discrete ones, um, we can look at sleep on a spectrum. So for example, autism and schizophrenia have been shown to have underlying genetic and neurophysiological causes. And across most psychiatric dis disorders, we see alterations in sleep behavior and sleep uh, physiology. And so for in our studies, such as this one in childhood onset schizophrenia, where we measured um, sleep in patients and in controls, we found diminished sleep spindles across both patient, uh, in, in the um, patients with childhood onset schizophrenia as, really, as compared to controls. And interestingly, we found the degree of um, the impairment in sleep spindles was associated with the number of hallucinations. In a separate sample, in a non-clinical sample, we found that there was a correlation between depressive symptoms and sleep spindles. So this really made us think that maybe sleep spindles are a more general feature of psychopathology rather than related to a specific disorder. Now, I'll just leave you with this. One of the things that makes it even more difficult to study sleep and mental health in this age range is that they're both moving targets. And by that, I mean that both sleep and mental health change over this uh, period. This is data from an ongoing study where we're studying sleep in a sample of adolescents with major depressive disorder or MDD. And here we have our healthy controls. And what you see across 
um, and every month we qu query them about their depressive symptoms and also their sleep. And what you see across this period is that, of course, while the depressed adolescents have more um, report more depression, um, there is also quite a lot of variability in the healthy controls. So on this scale, a, a value of 16 and above indicates a clinically significant depression. And as you can see, um, both in the major depressive disorders, they have periods of relative um, good mental health and also in the healthy controls, they suffer for periods of depression. And so now we're really working on um, longitudinal studies where we can look at these the temporal relationship between sleep and depression and other psychiatric disorders in order to make learn new insights into the underlying neurobiology of sleep and mental health. With that, I'd like to thank my team and my mentors and the source of, of our funding and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Leila, are you uh, here? Us? Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, good to see you. Uh, yeah, it was perfectly on time. It was actually, so you saved a couple of minutes. Great. Uh, yeah, well done. And uh, yeah, I would like to ask, uh, to invite questions. So please panelists, you can raise your hand and I can invite you or type in the chat or Q and A. Uh, please questions are invited. So I can maybe start with, a, okay, the, one of the comments from the Riemann terrific work. Thank you, Leila. Um, so but I will start uh, with, a, with a question. So uh, uh, is there evidence that disruption of sleep during um, childhood or adolescence is causal to emergence of uh, neuropsychiatric disorders? And is it possible to demonstrate at all? Yeah, so there have been a number of studies which have measured in large samples, measured self-reported measures of insomnia, and they find that those children and adolescents who report more insomnia are at about one and a half to two times more likely to develop a depressive episode a couple of years later. And so, you know, when with our study and with our study design, we're hoping to look more carefully at not just self-report, but also whether there's you know, other symptoms of a sleep problem like actigraphy based um, disruptions of sleep. Is it the timing of sleep? So we have evi some evidence in our data that it's the regularity of sleep, not much so much how much they sleep, but whether they go to bed and wake up at the same time that's most predictive of later mental health. So we're really trying to disentangle, you know, this this global measure of how well do you sleep from, you know, very specific factors of sleep to more precisely be able to say to parents, to educators, to clinicians, look, if you see these specific signs of disrupted sleep, it might be a marker or an alarm for a future mental health problem. Thank you. Any further questions, please? Uh, Irene Tobler. Please, can you unmute yourself? Ah, it worked. Thank you, Leila. It was a pleasure listening to you. I was wondering, listening to this once more, what, how do you handle confounding variables? I mean, you're working at an age where these adolescents have a lot of troubles, uh, for example, school. So how, how do you account for all of that when you're trying now to zoom and to sleep as, as you were answering to Vlad's question and, and then uh, potential neurological problems later or psychological? Thank you, that's a good question. So what we do when we do our EEG is we actually have them, we do a clinical interview um, and then we have them, their parents fill out lots and lots of questionnaires. Um, they're really, are the participants in our study are really devoted because they spend several hours answering our different questionnaires. Uh, they don't have to do it all at once, but they do do it. So that's one way. And then over the months where we ask them about their depression and sleep, we also ask them, um, we have a questionnaire for stress. So we ask them about their perceived stress, which interestingly, <laughs> we don't find any associations with sleep, but that's perhaps another story. Um, and we also ask them, um, are there any big life changes? We ask them about, 
if they're being bullied. Um, and then we have, you know, kind of a checklist of things that they can say, did you transition in school? Did your parents get divorced? Um, it's, we have this um, standardized questionnaire of major life events that we ask them. And so with that, we try to get a handle of kind of the different things that are going on with their lives at that time. But of course, um, it's imprecise. So we try as best as we can to kind of capture what's going on in their lives at, at each assessment. Thank you. Uh, so I will take the next question from the um, uh, from the chat window from Laura. Um, by treating insomnia during adolescence, may we impact on the trajectories of bipolar disorders, for example? Um, I really believe that we can. Um, there's good evidence in the literature that um, there are treatments for sleep, for example, with bipolar disorder. It's really, really important to have that rhythm that I mentioned, that going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time. Um, there are some short-term trials that show impacts and benefits of kind of sleep hygiene therapy and CBTI on mental health in youth. Uh, the study I presented, we actually have a two week intervention in our depressed adolescents and we're looking at the impact of that on um, mental health. Um, but I really think that, you know, um, and there are good data suggesting that if you treat the insomnia, independent of treating the mental health problem, you can improve outcomes. Thank you. Um, next question is from Professor Tina Paunia. Hi, Leila. Thank you very much for your great talk. So my question is also related to the confounding factors. So have you analyzed genetic uh, variations in your data set, like calculating for risk scores for insomnia, bipolar disorder, or that type of? Um, no, unfortunately, um, we haven't. The, the data I presented from the grant I presented, we have a very tiny budget. Um, but we did collect and free saliva um, in this sample, and hopefully one day we'll be able to analyze the genetic data and look at their genetic backgrounds. Yeah, I think that's feasible even with a smaller sample, given now the more better scores you can calculate. And it's not that expensive, actually. Your, your measurements are clearly more expensive. Yes. Um, and, you know, we just started a new study. So in this current sample, we're only looking at 60 adolescents. In our new study, we're collecting data in 200. And so hopefully we'll have a large enough data sample size um, to look at genetic factors and genetic, you know, um, poly, um, poly ge genetic, poly polygenetic risk factor scores. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, may I ask uh, attendees who, are, um, who put their hands uh, up, uh, please type the questions in the Q&A because we cannot, uh, in this webinar format, we can, cannot give you access to the microphone. Uh, so then we have a question uh, from um, Francis Cruz Sanabria. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Did you evaluate the impact of chronotype in the phenotype observed? Um, yes, we. Um, we have a lot of data on chronotype, morningness, eveningness, and then we also, uh, what I didn't show you is we also, in, across this year where we're um, every month asking them about their mental health, they also wear an actigraphy for the whole year, so we'll have a good measure of chronotype. We haven't specifically um, analyzed the data, but from looking through it, what you can really see is that the adolescents with depression and mental health problems, their sleep timing is a mess. So they go to bed very, very late, um, two or three in the mornings. And sometimes even they stay up till six in the morning. At first we were curious, is this, is this real data? <laughs> or are they, you know, what's going on? Why is there so much activity? And then so, because we follow them for a year, we, you know, we call the participant, hey, we see this, is that true? And they say, yes, actually it is. Um, and so we see a lot of disruption of chronotype, um, and even we have some participants who basically are, their day nights are flipped. So they, they are awake through the night and then sleep during the day. And so I think chronotype will also be an important factor um, for mental health and looking at these uh, adolescents. Thank you. <clears throat> Any further questions? We have a few more minutes. Okay, we have a question from uh, Professor Ferry. Uh, do you have any data on PSG features of sleep uh, of children under antidepressants? Yeah, so all our, um, all the data I presented here is um, 
we so at the initial um, assessment we look at their we require them to be medication free and so we look at their sleep eg uh, without medication but then we follow them for one year and a year later we um, measure their sleep eg again and most of our depressed sample are on medication then so we'll be able to compare medication free to with medication and see what the differences are in their sleep although it it can be a bit tricky because they take different kind of cocktails of medication. So, but we'll get a sense of the impact of medication on these kids. Thank you. Maybe I will ask one more question. Uh, uh, um, so there, um, uh, there, there is a comment also, sorry, from Professor uh, Ferry, a uh, long sleep latency may be RLS induced. We actually screen out for RLS and we um, do measure leg movements um, and we don't see that um, in our participants. We haven't had that. And um, keep in mind, um, our sample is 14 to 17 year olds. And so it's less common in that age group. Mm -hmm. So one question uh, I have, uh, can we recommend uh, napping as a way to deal with early school times to compensate for sleep loss? or it is not something that you would recommend? Um, it's not something I recommend because these children are usually, or adolescents are usually into, at school until four. So then if they nap after school, then it kind of pushes them their bedtimes even later and then makes it even more tricky for them to wake up at 6.30 in time for school. And so napping is really a bad strategy for these kids. And actually what we recommend um, and our, our sleep-based intervention is um, a reduction, so sleep restriction, so that they can build sleep pressure, sleep through the night, and get enough sleep and be refreshed in the morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leila. Are there any remaining questions from the audience, from panelists? Okay, if not, thank you very much. Thank well, you. Great to see you. And I would like to invite Professor Ferry to introduce our next uh, speaker. Thank you, Vlad. And uh, now we have uh, Tina Paunio from uh, the Department of Psychiatry of uh, the University of Helsinki in Finland, uh, who will present the genetics of insomnia. Please, uh, Dr. Paunio. Honored Professor Raymond, dear organizers, dear audience, it's my great pleasure to discuss with you today on genetics of insomnia. My name is Tina Paunio, and I come from University of Helsinki and Helsinki University Hospital and National Institute for Health and Welfare. I have divided this presentation into three parts. First, the genetic background, second, etiological models, and three, on epigenetic mechanisms. Let's start with the genetic background of insomnia symptoms. Insomnia can manifest with different types of symptoms, difficulty initiating sleep, maintaining sleep, early morning awakenings, subjective poor quality of sleep, or short sleep, shorter sleep than usual. Often these co-occur. And for a diagnosis of insomnia disorder, there need to exist daytime consequences. Insomnia is a very prevalent disorder. At symptom level, the prevalence is up to 50% and at syndrome level from 6 to 20%. Heritability of insomnia is moderate. According to twin studies, the heritability of poor sleep quality, an important aspect of insomnia, is around 30 to 50 percent. According to some studies, the estimates are higher for females than for males. We also found in a study on Finnish twins a clearly lower estimate for men than for women. According to large biobank studies, the overall SNP-based heritability is small or modest for insomnia. 
Thus, the data emphasizes for the presence of other than non-hereditary factors for insomnia symptoms. These factors are very likely to comprise environmental influences, ranging from early development to acute life stress. It is also likely that they interact with the genetic predisposing factors, but evidence for such interactions is quite scarce. The large biobank studies have nevertheless revealed genetic influences on the symptoms of insomnia. That kind of studies provide environment information of several subtle risk factors that collectively provide the composite genetic risk, polygenic risk score. In this study by Janssen and colleagues, one looked at the pattern of expression of genes with the risk variations and found suggestive evidence for involvement of specific brain regions, such as anterior cingulate cortex or basal ganglia, cerebellum or hypothalamus. We performed a systematic study on the correlations of genetic influences on sleep traits and psychiatric disorders. The peers for symptoms of insomnia correlated significantly and very robustly with short sleep duration, with a correlation coefficient of 65%. The correlation of insomnia with an accelerometer-based marker for fragmented sleep, number of sleep episodes, was only 10%. When looking at the overlap of the genes on chrom or chromosomal loci with genome significant hits, there was an overlap of seven genes or loci between insomnia and short sleep. Insomnia co-occurs with a number of other medical problems and disorders. In the following, I consider etiological models for that, emphasizing data based on the genetic studies. In the diagnostic systems ICD-10 or DSM-5, insomnia appears as a symptom for mood disorders, PTSD, substance withdrawal, or chronic fatigue. As what comes to the longitudinal risk insomnia confers for health, meta-analyses have provided evidence for insomnia as a risk for hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular events, or cardiovascular disorders as somatic disorders, or to Alzheimer's disease, psychotic symptoms, alcohol abuse, anxiety disorder, or depression as psychiatric disorders or brain disorders. The risk for anxiety and depressive disorders is substantial of a magnitude of two to threefold risk and differs thereby clearly from the risk for other medical disorders. But how can this high-level co-occurrence be explained? In the following, we consider three alternative etiological models. According to the first alternative, insomnia confers a risk for mental disorder, for example, major depression. The evidence from epidemiological studies is very clear and data from genetic studies also support this alternative. According to the second alternative, mental disorder such as depression confers a risk for insomnia. Evidence for this is less convincing, except for that alternative where treatment of the mental disorder such as some antidepressants can trigger insomnia. In the Finnish twin study, when we took into account genetic influences, we found robust evidence that poor sleep quality increases risk for incidence of depressed mood. But we did not find any evidence for the converse relationship. The third alternative, that insomnia and mental disorders share genetic risk factors, has obtained substantial evidence from the genetic studies. The large biobank studies have shown that the correlation of the genetic risk scores for insomnia and anxiety or depressive disorders is up to 5 to 5%. 5 
In our systematic study of the genetic risk scores for the sleep traits and mental disorders, we found significant correlation between insomnia and depression, anxiety, PTSD, ADHD, alcohol usage, and smoking. The pattern was very similar for short sleep, but there were no significant correlations for the sleep episodes. The more complicated analysis aiming at finding causalities using a method called Mendelian randomization resulted in a somewhat more inconcisive patterns. Overall, we got more evidence for causalities from the sleep to psychiatric traits than vice versa. For example, the genetic risk for insomnia appeared as a causal risk factor for bipolar disorder, but the risk for bipolar disorder did not appear as a risk for insomnia. Thus, regarding the comorbid pattern of insomnia with mental disorders, the genetic data evidences for both shared etiological background and the longitudinal risk for insomnia for mental health. Given the longitudinal risk insomnia causes for health, it is likely that there are underlying mechanisms that affect the basic cellular processes in brain and in peripheral tissues. Since all biological processes are eventually guided by the genetic code, this implies that there has to exist a mechanism or mechanisms that alter gene expression. In this final part, I briefly discuss the role of epigenetic mechanisms and more precisely DNA methylation for the secondary systemic effects of insomnia by shortly reviewing some recent findings of our own. In a sleep laboratory study performed by Professor Skeen and co-workers, we identified changes in DNA methylation of blood leukocytes along with accumulating acute sleep loss. As a general pattern, we observed hypomethylation of DNA methyloma. In a study of men from a community-based cohort and from an occupational cohort for shift work, we found a pattern of hypomethylation as well in individuals suffering from chronic sleep efficiency. In addition, there was a clustering of signals on genomic loci that had been previously linked to disturbances in visual processing and circadian regulation. Pathway analysis provided evidence for compromised processes of neuronal plasticity. In a third study, a pilot study on adolescent boys with depression and insomnia, and matched controls, we identified involvement of genes from pathway for synaptic long-term depression. Interestingly, half of these sites correlated also with electrophysi electrophysiological changes in sleep or subjective symptoms. Here is an example of a site at the gene encoding for PP2R5C, which correlated with flat anticipation of slow wave sleep, both in cases and in controls. Of course, this data is only preliminary, but it opens interesting avenues for future studies. To summarize, insomnia is a prevalent trait with modest heritability, but the effects of environmental factors are substantial. Regarding the comorbid pattern of insomnia with mental disorders, the data evidence is best for a, a shared etiological background and b the effect of sleep insufficiency on brain and regulation of emotions. Finally, epigenetic mechanisms are likely to be involved both in brain and in the systemic effects of insomnia, but more studies are required. In the end, I would like to finish by thanking you for your attention, as well as for our co-workers and the funding organizations for the support for our studies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paunio. And uh, I would like to invite the participants to 
pose some questions because I don't see any at the end uh, at the moment. Anyway, we can start with uh, a question of mine. <laughs> uh, you have already said something about this, uh, at least in some way. But don't you think that a better characterization of the insomnia in each patient by means of PSG would help understanding the genetic basis and maybe subgrouping uh, insomnia patients within the big heterogeneous group of patients? I, I, I'm sorry, Rafael, I had difficulties in hearing you. Could you, uh, could you? I don't, uh, okay, I put now my I, mic. Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. No, 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 I said that you have uh, said something about this with uh, some of your citations, but don't you think that the use of a PSG to better characterize insomnia would help also to better uh, have a better uh, results with the genetic studies yes, and I maybe also on the epigenetic mechanism involved. yeah absolutely so i think that that in these large biobank studies the measures used first the subjective question on sleep were by the way it's a combined question where usually they ask at the same time the sleep onset latency and fragmented sleep so it's of course quite rough measure not, not very fine and on the other hand the accelerometer studies so they're also it's of course not brain activity that's studied there but only only locomotor activity so so absolutely I, I, I totally totally agree and what we are for the time being aiming is to start systematically collect patient data also studying PGC, but of course it is PSG, but of course it is it is tedious. Oh yes, of course, but uh, I think if we want to advance, we need to do something more, you know. Absolutely. Uh, because, you know, the mechanism of um, sleep misperception might mm. be also based mm. on uh, genetics and you might be able to mm. identify yes. it in your patients. And, uh, yes, and one thing that I think would also be feasible is that people collect DNA samples also in those samples they already studied because of course you need study permission for that, but DNA in that sense, the DNA variations, they don't get old. I mean, they, they, they don't they don't change. And, and actually what we are now doing in collaboration with Hans van Dongen is that we obtain his, uh, from his sleep laboratory studies, DNA samples. And we are just now studying those individuals, but of course they are not patients, they are, they are healthy controls. Yeah, I think Dieter wants to pose a question. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, Tina, thank you very much for this very elegant uh, presentation and really bringing it all together from the genetic sphere. I was a little bit surprised about one slide you showed where you showed the, the pathways, which way it could go, insomnia to mental, mental to insomnia. And your data clearly show there is not a causality involved uh, mental disorders leading to insomnia. And I guess that many, probably 90% of psychiatrists, I know they would protest like crazy hearing this. Yes, I, I, I agree. Well, that's, that's a well, our data in the Finnish twins evidence for that, where there were two time points from studying, but also now we just performed in, in collaboration with Samuel Jones, these Mendelian randomization studies, which are only, of course, there you only uh, compare the genetic data, but you do it in an, in an established way. And there it was, uh, I think, quite clear that, that insomnia, uh, the genetic risk for insomnia appeared as a risk factor for mental disorders like bipolar disorder, but we really didn't see any, any evidence for the vice versa. On the other hand, in psychiatric patients, as all you who work with patients, you know that the symptoms, they come and they go. So that at the level of individual patient, you, you observe many different things. So what I'm talking here about is the group level of edit, kind of big picture. And, and, and we, we can dispute on this and, and you can have data that shows that we are, that my ideas were strong. So I don't kind of, and, and, I mean, I, I think we need to study this further, absolutely. Yeah, no, maybe just a brief comment. I, I really love this point of view because I, you know, I've been fighting for uh, acknowledging insomnia for, I don't know, 30 years now and the role it plays for mental disorders. But I think till 10 years ago, many psychiatrists they were just saying, this is an epiphenomenon. You know, know. We, we give our benzodiazepines and problems off, but uh, I think this is totally the wrong way. Yes, I, I totally agree with you. 
I mean, your work has been pioneer pioneering on that. So, so of course you think so, but also this also supports the view what we got from our new New York and less less uh, this uh, distinguished studies. Perfect. I don't see any other question. I think. I think we have some minutes. Anyway, if there is no other question, I there is to... there is a question from Stefano Bastianini, I believe. Yeah. Stefano, you raise your hand. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so as a thank you, Tina, for your presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you uh, had a look at the stress-related gene <laughs> and epigenetics on uh, if you have found any alteration in the methylation of some uh, genes also related to um, stress response and also to um, clock clock genes. If you had a look at this, yeah. Thank so you. The, thanks. So I was just actually looking at our gene list while preparing for this talk, and and there's surprisingly little little in clock genes we see. But but we have not been what I described here. We were looking at sleep insufficiency. We did not do any rhythm changes or challenge the challenge the rhythm. And uh, and I don't think I'm just checking here. I have the data here in my computer, so I don't think we observed anything related to glucocorticoid receptors or to the secondary messengers in like FKB5 or that kind of uh, genes. On the other hand, I must say that that the method we use for DNA methylation studies, even though I think it is exciting, but it's rough. We I think we should go and separate the cells, the different types of cells, and so on, so that so that there still might be issues that we don't see, and of course we don't have any brain biopsies, so that's that's for sure. Thank you, Tina. We do have another question. Uh, Paola Quocho is asking how much and in which way does the causality insomnia mental disorder and vice versa can impact on the setting of CBTI treatment? Thanks and great talk. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm I'm capable of, of answering that, but what but I think what the data evidence is indirectly is that 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 you should treat insomnia. And you should treat it before it comes very chronic, and before it gets you people get the secondary effects, and and it's not like well you get insomnia and, and that's that's clearly that you will get late, later depression. No, it's like you get insomnia, and if it's not treated, then then it gives the risk for depression. Well, this is now a little bit exa exaggerating, but but I think the evidence is for early treatment. Yes, uh, as a comment, uh, uh, insomnia is uh, something that should be always treated uh, because uh, if you consider it just as a comorbidity and uh, not important one, you you miss a big part of the problem. Yes, and we also, I didn't show not that now that data because it's not yet on genetics, but we have look at now in a big sample of patients with psychosis, a sample of 10,000 patients. And we have their, their subjective sleep data based on questionnaires. And we clearly see that the, a cluster of patients, uh, about one sixth of the patients who have significant amount of insomnia symptoms, which affect their life quality. So that also, even if you have a severe mental disorder, if you simultaneously have insomnia symptoms, you should treatment. And there are groups from Sweden and other countries who have shown that for depression, of course. Okay, I think there are no more questions, but you have to close the session. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Ferry. Um, uh, it was a fantastic uh, session, so thank you very much. I would like to uh, thank uh, the, all the speakers and all the participants for many exciting questions. And normally this would have been just the beginning, and now we would have continued to discuss all this science and everything informally. Uh, outside, but unfortunately, we have to close the uh, session now uh, in a, virtually. So uh, the uh, meeting continues tomorrow at 10.30, so there are really many exciting talks uh, are on the program, so I would encourage everyone to join and be on time, uh, and as we did today, uh, and um, thank you again, and uh, have a very good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.